Okay, so it's very nice to be here. Thanks to uh, Julia and uh, Luca for the invitation. <coughs> and I will speak about the joint work with my uh, PhD student, uh, Guy Moshkovitz. Um, so as the title suggests, I will, sh I will I hopefully I will get to show you the entire proof of a, of a famous theorem of uh, Gowers that gives a lower bound for Semeredi's regularity lemma. So I will start by defining what is what is Semeredi's regularity lemma, if you don't know what it is. Um, uh, so roughly speaking, the regularity lemma says that I can take any graph and partition it in, into a bounded number of bipartite graphs that behave like random graphs. Okay, so what is a property we expect to find if we pick a random bipartite graph on two vertex sets of size n where we pick every edge with probability d for some real number d between 0 and 1. So, uh, so throughout the talk I will uh, use uh, d of x and y where x and y are two sets of vertices to be the density in a graph g between two vertex sets between x and y, meaning the number of edges with one vertex in x and one vertex in y divided by the size of x times the size of y. Okay, so it's kind of like if I pick two vertices, two random vertices in x and y, what is the probability that I will get an edge? Okay, and I will say that the bipartite graph a, b on vertex sets a and b with, with edge set e is epsilon regular if the following condition holds, so let's uh, parse it together, it means that no matter if I pick any subset A prime in A and any subset B prime in B, as long as they are not too small, meaning that they should contain at least an epsilon fraction of the vertices of, of A and B respectfully, then the density between A prime and B prime should be more or less like the density between A and B, meaning that they should be deviate by at most epsilon. Okay, so here's the picture you should have in mind, is that if this is by the bipartite graph A, on vertices A and B, and it has, and the density of edges between A and B is some real number D, then no matter how I pick a vertex set A prime in A and B prime in B, the density between them should be plus minus D, the density between A and B. Okay? So, if any questions? So what is the regularity lemma? So, the, so let me say that, again, throughout the talk, I will always use this notation V for a partition of the vertex set of a graph G. And I will say that the partition into, so a partition of the vertexes of a graph into K sets is epsilon regular if it satisfies the following condition. All the sets are of the same size. Okay, so each set V1 up to VK is of size N over K, plus minus 1 if, K, if N is not divisible by K. And the following condition holds is that if you take any set in the class, any set in the partition VI, then for almost all the other sets Vj, meaning that all, all of them besides epsilon k of them, the pair Vi, Vj is epsilon regular. Okay? So you take the partition into k sets, into k clusters, and you want that if you pick any cluster Vi, and you look at all the other clusters V1 up to Vk, then almost all of them form an epsilon regular bipartite graph with Vi. Okay? That's it. And the regularity lemma of Semeredi says that you give me any positive epsilon, there is a constant that depends only on epsilon, which I will denote by m of epsilon, such that any graph has an epsilon regular partition where the number of clusters is bounded by m. Okay, so no matter how large the graph is, I can always find a partition into a bounded number of clusters. Okay, note that I can always partition the graph into singleton, into, into clusters that contain one vertex, so a bipartite graph with one vertex in each side is trivially epsilon regular, but the, the, the whole point is that you want to partition the graph into a bounded number of clusters. Okay? So uh, since I, will, I want to try and give you the entire proof, so I will not go over the numerous applications of the regularity lemma. By now it's probably one, one of the most important tools in extremal graph theory, if not the most important uh, tool. But the main drawback of the regularity lemma is that, the, is that when we apply it, we, the, any, any quantitative bound we get from, this regularity, from the regularity lemma depends on this function m, m of epsilon. And the, the main drawback is that the bound we get from the proof of the regularity lemma is, is given by a tower of exponents of height polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Okay, 
So although the number of clusters we have here is bounded, it's given by 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2, where the height of this tower is polynomial in 1 over epsilon. OK? And if you, if you look at the proof, which is, again, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's a one-page proof. You sense that there, should, there has to be something more, some more clever that you can get, that you can do to get a, a better bound. So I wasn't around these days, at least not academically. But, uh, but I think the main uh, the people thought if they, that, that this shouldn't be the correct bound. It should be like 2 to the 2 to some polynomial in 1 over epsilon. But surprisingly, Gowers proved that this tower type dependence is indeed the correct order. So in his famous paper, he gave two proofs. So the, the first proof showed that m of epsilon indeed grows like a tower, like a tower function of 1 over epsilon but only tower of height logarithmic in 1 over epsilon, which already meant that any application of the regularity lemma is only of, of theoretical uh, uh, nature. And he also gave a, another proof that shows that the m of epsilon indeed grows like a tower of height polynomial in 1 over epsilon, but this proof is extremely long and complicated to the, the, to the point that I have to admit that I, I never managed even to get through the definition of the graph. I just heard that Julia managed to do this, uh, but, uh, or a student, or both of them together. But, uh, but, but this is, I mean, so everything I'm going to say is only about the show proof, which is one of the most, I mean, one of my all-time favorite proofs. It's really an ingenious argument. But regretfully, it only gives the weaker bound. And we have this more complicated proof that gives the, uh, the correct, or I mean, up to the constant here, which is 5. And this is 1 over 16. And what I want to give here is almost to show the, to give you a short proof of, of this type of lower bound. Okay? And I should mention that uh, 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 Conlon and Fox gave another proof of, of the sa of, uh, same nature. Here, the construction is much simpler than the construction in Gower's paper, but the proof is, all, I mean, is roughly the same level of complication. Okay? And I will, if I have time, I'll say some things about, uh, some other points about these two, two results at the end. Okay, so it's clear what, what we want to do. Okay, so that's, the, that's what we want to prove, something like this. Okay, and uh, I should mention from the beginning that the, 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 it's, uh, our argument is basically takes this <coughs> very elegant and short argument and tweaks it in several places in order to get a lower bound of this type. Okay? Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to present you a short and simpler proof of, of, this, of this result. Again, I'm not claiming that it's simple. It's simpler, and it is short. OK? <laughs> OK, so some preliminary observations. So you can think of a graph as taking a complete graph and assigning weights to the edges where an edge gets weight 1 and a non-edge gets, gets weight 0. Right? OK, so uh, what we will work with is is complete graphs that get, get weights, that each edge gets a weight that is not necessarily 0 and 1, but some real number between 0 and 1. OK? So we will, throughout the talk, a graph will always be a complete graph where every edge gets a weight between 0 and 1. And a simple observation is that if you take, if you take this a weighted graph of this type and you generate a random graph from this complete weighted graph, then with high probability, the graph that you get, the genuine graph that you get, has the same regular partitions as the original graph you had, weighted graph. Okay? Actually, I just, so I just forgot to say something that is written here. Then once we decide to work with weighted graph, I can define a density of a pair of vertex sets. Right? I would just take two vertex sets, and I will sum the total weight between them and divide by the size of x and the size of y. So I can define the density in a weighted graph. I can define what it means to be epsilon regular in a weighted graph. There, then, then I can define what it means for a partition to be epsilon regular in a weighted graph. Right? All the definitions carry over very naturally to weighted graphs as well. Okay. So what I claim is that if you take a weighted graph and you generate a random graph from it, then by simple Chernoff inequality, you get that all sets of size, let's say, square root n, have the correct density between them. And therefore, if you have a regular partition in one graph with high probability, it will be a, a, a regular partition also in the other graph. Okay? 
So what we get from this observation, and even if you don't believe this observation, which is very simple, then what we need to prove, and, and this is what we do, is to show the following, is that for every e positive epsilon, there is a weighted graph G, okay? Such that every epsilon regular partition of this weighted graph is of size tower one over square root epsilon. Okay? So that's, so that's what we do. So that's what I will try to describe in the rest of the talk. Okay, so any, any questions up to now? So it's clear what I mean by this weighted graph. Okay, it's just a complete graph and I assign every edge some real number between zero and one. So okay? Generating a random graph is simply mean taking an edge with probability equal to its weight. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I take every, I put an edge with a probability given by the number that is written on this edge. Okay, so there is only one ingredient which I will not prove and it is the following uh, lemma. So I will parse it uh, slowly. Uh, so what the lemma says is the following, is that suppose I have a, a, a positive integer small m and, a, and I have capital M which is exponential in small m. Then I can find, I can construct m partitions of the office of a universe of size capital M. So I will denote these partitions by A1, B1 up to A and BM, okay? So, such, that the following, uh, so, so, so that the following two conditions are satisfied. So the first condition is very simple, is that each of the partitions uh, breaks the universe into two sets of equal size, capital M over two, okay? Okay, the most, substantial, the most substantial condition is the following, is that, that if you take any m-dimensional vector, lambda one up to lambda m, such that we think of this vector lambda as like a distribution, okay? And what do we want for this vector to, to satisfy? So of course, each of its, if its entries is non-negative, the sum of the entries is one, and it's a non-trivial distribution, meaning that all the entries are bounded away from one. How, how much bounded away? By, let's say, one minus eight delta for some real number delta, okay? So again, so I have this sequence of partitions, as, as the name suggests, they are quasi-random partitions, so we think that they are kind of break the universe of size M randomly, okay? And what you want is that if you take any vector that is, that is not trivial, then I will be able to find M over six by partition, so one-sixth of these partitions will satisfy the following condition, is that if you sum the entries of the vector that belong to AI to one side of the partition, and you will sum the entries of this vector that belong to the other part of the partition into BI, both of them will be non-negligible. Each one of them will have measure at least delta. Okay? So again, of course you cannot, you will not be able to do this if the vector was just had one entry, which is one, right? But as long as I, I, I guarantee to you that all the entries are bounded away from one, then I claim that I can find such a sequence of partition such that I will be able to find many, par many bipartitions, A, I, B, I, that break this vector non-trivially. And the important thing is that this should happen for every vector lambda. Okay? Okay, so we will take this lemma as a fact. Sets, yeah, so, the pool, so you take, right, so we take the, the construction just to take random uh, partitions and then say that with high probability they are more or less balanced and then say that once they are balanced then they satisfy this condition. Okay, so now we are ready to describe, so in the next two slides I will describe what is the graph that is hard for the regularity lemma, meaning that every regular partition of this graph must be very large and then I will try to finish the proof and show you why this is indeed the case. Okay? Okay, so even if I, even if I will not say so, then I will assume that epsilon, the input to the, 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 input to the regularity lemma or this construction is smaller than some absolute constant and that n, the number of vertices, is, is large as a function of epsilon. Okay? Okay, so and now I need to define this graph, so I take a, a set of n vertices, and I define a sequence of partitions x0, x1, and so on, as follows. So x0 is the entire vertex set of the graph. Okay, I, I should stress, now I'm just defining a partition of the vertices, I'm not saying anything about the graph itself. Okay, so you just think of n, 
a collection of n vertices, and I'm, and I'm now just chopping this set of vertices. So x0, the first partition, is the, the trivial partition into one big cluster. And once I defined x sub r, then x sub r plus 1 is obtained from xr by taking each of the clusters of xr and breaking it into exponentially many subclusters. How, how exponentially? 2 to the size of the, to the number of clusters in the previous partition over 100, let's say. Okay? And you should observe that this is exactly the same function that I had in the previous slide, right? About this quasi-random partitions, right? I mean, I said that I can, if I have capital M is 2 to the small m over 100, okay? So this is the same thing that I have here, okay? So, of course, we have that the number of clusters in the first partition is just one, and each partition has exponentially many more partitions than the previous one, so we get that the number of clusters in partition xr is, is a tower function of r, or let's say r over 2 or something like that. Okay? So this is just, I didn't say anything about the edges of this graph, or the weights on the edges of the graph, right? Okay, so now I'm going to define what is, the, what is the graph, and I again remind you that I'm defining a weighted complete graph, not a, not a, not a usual graph where I, ha I have either an edge or a non-edge, okay? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to define this graph using an iterative process, okay? So meaning that I'm going to have 1 over square root epsilon uh, many iterations, and in each iteration I'm going to keep adding more and more weight to some of the edges of the graph, okay? So... So suppose now we are at, iter at iteration r. So we've already added some weight to some of the edges of the graph, and now we are at iteration r. Okay, so hopefully it will not be too painful. So this is the most complicated definition. Again, this is relatively, remember, this is short and simpler. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following. So we are at iter iter iteration r. So let me, let me name the clusters in partition x sub r by x1 up to xm, okay? Okay, so let's see. So this is the picture that you should have in mind. So Okay, so I'm, I'm naming the clusters of partition xr by x1 up to xm, and I'm naming the clusters of partition xr plus 1 using this uh, scheme. Okay, so let me remind you what, how, how did we define this sequence of partitions in the previous slide, is that we took every cluster of xr and we broke it into exponentially many smaller clusters, right? So if you want... If we take x, if this is if this is a cluster x i in partition, so this is x i that belongs to x sub r, and this is x j, then remember that each of these clusters, what we did is to we broke them into many subclusters. Okay, and what we what I want you to think about is that, so for example, these x sub one up to x sub m. It, the union of these clusters is this cluster, okay? And the union of these clusters is, is this cluster, okay? So, so what we have here is, uh, let's say here we have x i 1 up to x i m. Okay, so we have capital M many small clusters inside each of the clusters of x r, okay? Okay, and now what, what, what I want to do, I want to pick um, a sequence of partitions of capital M. So remember, capital M is the number of small clusters inside, inside each of the clusters of X sub R. Okay, so I want to pick a small M, A1 up to A1, B1, AM up to BM, a sequence of partitions of capital M that satisfy the properties of this lemma that we've previously had. Okay. Okay. 
And what I want to do now, now, I'm, now I need to define what is the graph? What, what, what kind of edges am I adding at iteration R? Okay, so the, number, the edges that I'm adding is the following. So I'm just focusing on two clusters in partition XR, so XI and XJ. And now I'm going to tell you which, how I'm going to update the, the weight of the edges between XI and XJ. Okay, so I'm going to do it in the following manner. Okay, so I'm going to take partition AJ, BJ. So remember, I said that it's going to be a little painful. So I'm going to take partition AJ and BJ, and using partition AJ, BJ, I'm going to partition XI into two sets, which I'm going to call AIJ, BIJ. And how, am I, how will I partition XI into two sets? I'm going to think of these clusters, each one of them has an index, one up to M, right? So, and remember that A, each one of these partitions, A, I, B, I, or A, J, B, J, partitions capital M into two sets, right? So just take this partition, A, J, B, J, and use it into, into and, and break X, I into two sets, A, I, J, and B, I, J. Okay? So again, so AJ, BJ is a partition of capital M into two sets. So just, just take the indices that, that are written in AJ, group, group them together, these clusters, into one, one set, AIJ, and go, take all the indices that are written in B sub J and use them to define this set, BIJ. And this gives you a partition of XI into two sets. Okay? By the way, what can you tell me about the size of these sets, AIJ and BIJ? Are they of the same size, not the same size? The same size, right? Because A, remember that AJ and BJ, I, the, the, this partition is, is a partition of a capital M into two sets of size capital M over two. Okay? Now I'm going to do the same. Asan, yes? So the way in which you partition the cluster XI into the smaller clusters, um, XI1, XI... Um, it's completely is, this arbitrary. There is nothing. The only yeah. constraint is that yeah, I just take each the, piece is the same size. Yes. Okay. And now I'm going to do the same with xj. So of course now I'm going to do the same with xj. Now I'm just, but in order to partition xj, I'm going to take the partition of capital M whose index is ai. Okay, so now I also break xj into two sets of equal size and I'm going to call them aji and bji. Okay, the, the, the important thing is that when I'm Breaking XI into two sets, AIJ, BIJ, it's, I mean, sorry, let me go back. Is that what I'm describing now is with respect to two clusters, XI and XJ. If I was working with XI and XK, then I would break XI into two sets, AIK, BIK, but I would be working with AK, BK, not AJ, BJ. So it's not one, when I define the graph, I don't have one partition of XI into two, into two sets but I have a partition for every other cluster XJ, okay? But, but the nice thing is that I can, when I define the graph, I can just focus on, on just two clusters in this graph, okay? And now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take all the edges, all the pairs that have one vertex here and one vertex here and increase their weight by square root epsilon, and I'm gonna take all the edges that have one vertex here and one vertex here and increase the weight by square root epsilon. And I'm, go I'm not going to do this with respect to edges that are, that are these cross edges. Okay? So that's it. That's, that's the whole definition of the graph. And, of, and note that because I'm doing this only one over square root epsilon many times, then the weight of an edge is, is always between zero and one. Okay? And if you want to think what is the intuition behind this construction is that what I want to do, I want to make sure that if an adversary, let's say, comes and he wants to take my graph and find the regular partition of this graph, then he cannot use these partitions x1 or x2 and so on as regular partitions, right? Because if he would take xi to be a cluster and xj to be a cluster, then because I added this, the weight, I increased the weight between, let's say, these two parts, then this bipartite graph is no longer epsilon regular, right? because you have some density between them, and then I suddenly come and I increase the density between half of the vertices here and half of the vertices here by square root epsilon. 
which is much more than epsilon. Okay? Okay, so again, so the intuition that we, that we keep in mind is that iteration R, what, what, what I'm doing in iteration R, I'm preventing X sub R from being an epsilon regular partition of the graph. Okay? Um, okay, now let's go back to this definition, to the definition of the graph, and if you, again, you think about it for a second, you'll see that if you disregard what happens at iteration, you take two clusters x, i, and x, j in, in x, r, okay? And suppose I, I do not perform iterations r, r plus one, and so on. I stop after iterations, r, after r minus one iterations, then if you look at this bipartite graph, it's a completely uniform bipartite graph, meaning all the, all the a, a edges between x, i, and x, j have exactly the same weight written on them, okay? Only in iteration R, suddenly I, I introduce some discrepancy between, between two subsets in X, I, and X, J, okay? And of course, what can happen, I mean, and this is the main difference between our proof and the proof, and the, and the proof in Gauss paper, is that observe that, that, that even if I introduce this discrepancy in iteration R, the later iteration can somehow uh, cancel this discrepancy, right? Because I'm not stopping after iteration R. When I'm performing iterations R plus one and so on, I keep adding more and more weight to the graph. And, and theoretically, it can be that somehow the density between these two parts will increase by more than the density between these two parts and everything will suddenly will cancel, okay? Which will not happen, but that's what we need to prove, okay? Okay, and then that, so if you, again, so if you, Again, convince yourself that if you disregard iterations R and R plus one and so on, and you take two clusters, X, I, and X, J, and it's, perfectly, it's a perfectly uniform uh, bipartite graph, then, again, it's not hard to see that if you take the finest partition, so again, I define the sequence of partition X, zero, X, one, and so on. If you take the finest partition, the last partition where the clusters are the smallest, then it's a, again, it's a perfectly regular partition. If you take any two clusters in this partition and you look at the weight between the edges there, all the weights, all the edges there have the same weight, okay? So again, the finest partition is a perfectly regular partition of the graph. Of course, that, that's, that's not a problem because it's a, it's a huge partition. It's a partition into tower of one over root epsilon many clusters, right? Okay, so again, so if I take the finest partition in this graph, then if you take any bipartite graph in this partition, then all the edges have the same weight. So this bipartite graph might have density 0 0.1, here we might have density 0, here we might have density 1, and so on and so on, okay? So the finest partition is a perfectly regular partition of the graph, okay? So not let me, now let me ask you a question. So the, the finest partition of the graph is, is, is a zero regular partition of the graph. Okay, it says it's epsilon regular for any positive epsilon. So is it true that this is the, but remember our goal is to find just an epsilon regular partition of the graph, not a zero regular partition. Is it true that this finest partition is the only epsilon regular partition of the graph? So again, this partition, the, the, the one with the smallest, the, 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 the finest partition with the smallest cluster is zero regular. Is it true that this is, but I want to find only, I mean, the adversary, say, he only needs to find an epsilon regular partition. Is it true that this partition is also the only epsilon regular partition of the graph? Well, you can go you find stop, it. Right? Each cluster finally is just one vertex now, right? I mean, you're not continuing. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You I'll could refine it. Yes, yeah, up to, of course, yeah, but without refining. If you refine it, this is true. But observe that if I take one vertex from this cluster and I move it to another cluster and I exchange them, this will, if, if the partition is zero regular, if I m switch two vertices, of course it will stay an epsilon regular partition because it will not affect the densities by, by much, right? Or more generally, if I, if I move around an epsilon fraction of the vertices, or let's say epsilon square fraction of the vertices or something like that, the partition will stay epsilon regular because, okay? And this is what we're gonna show, actually. That the only way to get an epsilon regular partition is to take this finest partition and possibly move around some vertices of the graph, okay? 
Um, Okay, so now we come to, uh, to again, an important observation about, this, about how, this, how this construction works, is that I claim that if you take any cluster uh, X in XR, so for example, you take cluster XJ, so you take this cluster, and you take any vertex U, then by how much did I increase the density between, okay, we already have the answer here, but I'm still going to ask it, so by how much did we increase the density between U and the cluster X? Oh, here it's why I call it XJ. Okay, so I take so I take a vertex here. Let's delete this. Okay. And so I take some so I take this entire cluster XJ and some vertex here. So vertex U. And the question is then, by how much did I increase the density between U and the entire cluster XJ? Okay, so remember that, wh how, what did I do? I, I, I broke XJ into two sets of equal size, I broke XI into two sets of equal size, and then I added some, s to added half of the edges, I increased the density by square root epsilon, right? So this means that no matter which what, what U is, the total increase in the density is going to be half square root epsilon, right? I mean, it's very important, again, that the cluster that I break XJ into two sets of equal size. And since this is true for any vertex U, then this will be also true for any collection of vertices, capital U. Okay? This is true only for all vertices outside of X, right? Again, what? So, so this is not true if U is in X, no? It, it's actually, it, it actually doesn't really matter. I mean, it is true because... I'm going to, what the, the construction is actually, I'm going to do it for when xi equals xj. Oh, okay. okay, I'm actually doing for any a, i and j that are not necessarily distinct. Okay, so more generally, if I take any cluster x and I take any set of vertices u, then the total density, the total increase in the density between u and x in iterations r, r plus 1, and so on until the end is given by this expression. Which is not very, I mean, it's not very important what is this exp expression, it's just, I mean, if it's here, then let me explain. It's just the number of iterations that I have after iteration r times one half square root epsilon. The important thing is that the total increase in the density is, is independent of what, what this cluster x is and what the, the set of vertices u is. Okay? Okay. So now we arrive at the key. How much more time do I have? 10 minutes. Okay. So, okay, let's see where, where we get. Okay, so, um, so let me say that, um, that is, so I have two, uh, two vertex, vertex sets in a graph, or uh, two, two uh, sets in general. So I will say that A is alpha, contain, is alpha contained in, in B, if B contains one minus alpha of the elements of A, okay? So in the intersection of A and B contains at least one minus alpha of A. So for example, A is zero contained in B simply if A is contained in B, okay? And now let me, let me uh, generalize this definition not to two sets but to two partitions of, of a set. So suppose I have two partitions of the vertexes of a graph. So let me call them uh, Z and X. So I will say that Z is alpha contained in X if every cluster of Z is alpha contained in some cluster of X. Okay, so for example, Z is zero contained in X if and only if Z is a refinement of X. Okay. Okay, so what is the key lemma? So the key lemma in the proof is the following fact. Is that if you take a partition Z, and you assume that it is, it is epsilon regular, and you also assume that it is alpha contained in partition X sub R. So remember that our partition of the graph was built upon a sequence of partition of the vertex of the graph, X0, X1, and so on. So suppose you somehow manage to prove that, so that the adversary comes and show, tells you here is an epsilon regular partition of the graph, and you manage to prove that it is an alpha, uh, that it is alpha contained in partition X sub R, 
then the lemma says that this partition is also alpha plus 8 epsilon contained in the next partition, xr plus 1, as long as this alpha is not uh, larger than, let's say, square root epsilon. Okay? So I claim that once, you, if you believe this key lemma, then we are done. Okay, so why is that? Is that I claim that, for example, we immediately get the following corollary, that if z is an epsilon regular partition of, of g, then it's 8 square root epsilon contained in x 1 over square root epsilon. So again, so remember that x 1 over square root epsilon is the finest partition. It's this partition. It's the one with the smallest clusters. And what does it mean that z is 8 square root epsilon contained in this partition? It means that it is obtained from this partition, this, the finest partition, after moving around square root epsilon fraction of the vertices of the graph. Okay? And why is that? It's simply because z is any partition is 0 contained in x sub 0, because x sub 0 is the entire partition of the graph. And now you just apply this key lemma over and over again until you get this fact. Okay? And of course, if you have a partition, again, a partition into sets of equal size, that is, I mean, 8 square root epsilon, again, we think of epsilon as something small, so let's, let's assume that epsilon is small enough so that 8 square root epsilon is larger than 1 half. So if z is 1 half contained in x1 over square root epsilon, then every cluster of z is at least, um, then this, the number of cluster in z is at least, the number of clusters in this partition divided by 2, let's say. But since this is a tower of height 1 over square root epsilon, then the same applies to this partition. OK? OK, so the only thing that remains is to prove this lemma. Um, oh, if I have 10 minutes. Uh, Okay, so uh, you should keep in mind this definition of what it means for A to be alpha contained in B and what it means for a partition to be alpha contained in another partition, and this is the key lemma that we want to prove, right? Okay, so we just, uh, what is the obvious thing we should do? So somebody comes and tells us that here we have a partition Z that is alpha contained in X sub R, but is not alpha plus 8 epsilon contains in the next partition, xr plus 1. So what does it mean? It means that there is a rogue cluster, let's call it z sub 0. So z sub 0 is alpha contained in some cluster xi, in x sub r, right? Because the assumption of the lemma is that partition z is alpha contained in x sub r, right? So every cluster of z is alpha contained in some part cluster of x sub r, but it happens that it's not alpha plus 8 epsilon contained in any of the smaller clusters of xr plus 1. So again, so our z0 is, is alpha <coughs> contained in this xi, but it's not alpha plus 8 epsilon contained in any of these smaller clusters. Right? I mean, this is, this is what... So now what we need to show, we need to find epsilon k cluster other sets of z, such that z0 and z is not epsilon regular, right? Because that's what it means to be not epsilon regular. We need to find one cluster that is not epsilon regular with many other clusters in the partition, right? Okay. Okay, so I first claim, um, I first claim the following, that so oh, okay, okay. So remember that we we assume that z zero is some is is a cluster that that lives inside x i. So this is z zero. It lives here, right? And the assumption that that it is alpha contained in x i, but it is not alpha plus eight epsilon contained in any of these clusters. Okay. Then I claim that remember that we have these partitions uh, that I that when I define the graph in iteration R, I had these many ways of breaking xi into two sets, aij, bij, right? Then I claim that m over 6, um, okay, so let me again say what, I, what I'm trying to say here. So we have partition xi, which, which is a cluster in partition x sub r, and then I have many other clusters in xr, so xj is just a representative, one of the other clusters, okay? And remember that in x, 
the number of clusters in XR, so the size of XR, is small m, right? So I claim that one-sixth of the partitions Xi and Xj satisfy this condition. That if you take this intersection of Z0 with Aij and the intersection of Z0 with Bij, both of them contain, contain at least an epsilon fraction of Z0. Okay? So if I... So let's, let me draw Xi again. So this is Xi. I'm drawing it again. And Z0 sits somewhere here. So this is Z0. Then remember that for every other cluster Xj, I broke Xi into two cluster, into two subsets of equal size, Aij and Bij. So what this lemma says, what this claim says, is that for many of them, one-sixth of them, if you, lay, if you look at how Aij and Bij break Z0, then again, one-sixth of them are such that Z0 has at least an epsilon fraction on the left and at least an epsilon fraction on the right. Okay? And why, and wh how do we get this? So we get this immediately from the way we chose these quasi-random partitions of, uh, of capital M, right? Because what will I do? I will define a vector, right? I will define a vector lambda 1 up to lambda M, where lambda I will tell me what is the fraction of vertices of Z0 inside partition into cluster A. Uh, a, into the ith cluster, right? Now, what is the assumption of, what, what do we know about this vector lambda? So, what we know about this vector lambda, so, of course, it's a, it's a distribution, right? Because it's just a distribution of how Z0 is distributed among these sets. And it's a non-trivial distribution, right? Because of the assumption that Z0 is not alpha plus 8 epsilon contained in any of these clusters. So, all of these entries are bounded away from 1, and therefore, the lemma tells you that you can find many partitions that break it in a non-trivial way. And a non-trivial way will exactly give you this, this condition. Okay, since I think I'm running out of time, so let me just give you a, how, do we, how do we proceed from here. Then the main idea of the rest of the proof, and this is, let me tell you just what is the main difference between our argument and the, Ga and the, and the proof in Gauss paper, is that after we do another step, then what we end up with is the following situation, is that, again, so we have x, we have z0 that lives here inside xi, and we have this cluster xj, okay? And then we have a partition, we manage to partition x, z0 into two, I mean, we partition, we have a partition of one of these partitions, aij, bij, and we know that z0 has a non-trivial density in each of the sides. Now we find many other cluster xj, actually one-sixth of the other clusters. And then we can assume, again, just for the sake of the argument, that xj is just a union of clusters from z. So each of these is a cluster from Z. Okay, and if, if, let's even assume that it, that it looks like this. So we have here this partition A, J, I, and B, J, I. So what happens in, in Gower's argument is that what he says is that because I've increased the density between this part and this part, and I didn't increase the density between this part and this part, this is exactly like we do, then Z0 and let's say this cluster cannot be epsilon regular, right? Because you have more density between this part and this cluster and this part and this cluster, okay? But because, because he's doing it this way, then he has to pay pri two, I mean, he has to pay some price in two other parts of the proof, which that's why his argument gives only a tower of log one over epsilon. But in, what we do is instead of arguing about this Z0 and a specific cluster in this side, what we argue about this Z0 and the entire collection of, of clusters in this side. And what we say is, okay, it could be the case that, that because of the, that the discrepancy introduced in level R, so this is what I've managed, uh, mentioned at the beginning, it could be that the discrepancy introduced in level R was somehow cancelled by the later iterations of the proof, okay? So this can happen for Z0 and one cluster here, but it cannot happen for Z0 and many of the clusters here. 
Okay? So what we show is that if you take Z0 and all this collection of clusters, so it's not true that this Z0 and all of them form an irregular, an irregular pair. What we show is that Z0 and many of them form irregular pair, and this is enough for, uh, for the proof to work. Um, okay, so unfortunately this is the only thing that I managed. You see, it's not, I was almost done. So just one more thing that I wanted to mention is that, so Gower's second example in the second proof and in the proof of uh, Conon and Fox, so they prove again, so they prove a tower of, of height polynomial in one over epsilon, but these proof, I mean, these uh, uh, proofs have a, the, the additional feature is that they prove this lower bound for a weaker version of the regularity lemma, okay, which I'm not mentioned because so again, so we leave it as an open problem if you can also take our example, our proof, and also tweak it in order to get these stronger results about the same lower bounds for stronger version of the regularity lemma. Okay. Even uh, this one by uh, you and uh, Noga alone, which uh, give him even worse bound for a super regularity lemma, where it's a uh, wow. Mm -hmm. So are these uh, bounds uh, also also sharp? And uh, so other examples showing that for that theorem, it's also you cannot improve it. So, I mean, you, you talk about the strong regularity yeah, lemma. Strong yeah, so the original proof was uh, like an iterated tower, so a wowser type. Yeah. yeah, so we know that, it's, that this is wowser is actually the truth for the strong regularity lemma. Do you have stronger and stronger with uh, higher and higher uh, functions? I'm not, sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure you get anything from iterating the strong regularity lemma again. So it's... it's the end of the world. Well, good hypergraphs, then you get, you get the actual hierarchy. Right, so this is, uh, yeah, so, yeah, you, I, I don't know how to prove uh, Ackerman for the hypergraph regularity lemma. Lower bound. Lower bound, sorry, yeah. Yes? Yeah, you said that um, the lower bound is the regularity lemma, but you could also say that the lower bound is the regularity lemma. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. 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 Uh, okay, so we take, we take these, this, uh, again, so for the sake of the argument, suppose AJI is just a disjoint union of set Z, okay? So what we say is that you assume that there are not many bad pair, uh, that there are not a lot of, let's take it off now. It will, be, it will take me two minutes to explain this. Um, so this is about whether this adapts to the arithmetic version of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, there, is a, there is not currently a lower bound of this type for that number, I think. You mean for your uh, proof? Wait, in your paper you did something. Yeah, but it was the weaker, the weaker Gowers okay. thing with a tower of height in one of those. Yeah, so we are trying to do this as... Uh, or my student is trying to do this as... Uh, or you might be sleeping now, but... Uh, <laughs> as soon as he wakes up. What? <laughs> as soon as he wakes up. <laughs> Yeah. The tower of size log is already. Yeah. yeah. You cannot underestimate. Since Ben is sitting behind you, then. Does, it, does yeah. your construction give any insight into this, into the half graph world of Meniere's and Shella? I mean, that's that's one of the most exciting things that happened for me. And can you see that in your construction? I mean, besides the fact that it that I mean, the graph has many half graphs, but. Uh, you talk about that they, they have a bound that depends on the largest half graph induced. Yeah. 